If you have a Bible, let's open to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 19, and then let me ask you to stand, if you will. We're going to read the Scripture. Luke, chapter 19, we'll begin with verse 37. Then as he, speaking of Jesus, was now drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, saying, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And he answers and says to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. So, Lord, we pray as we take some time here in this passage that you, once again, would speak to our hearts and that our hearts would be open and soft to receive what you have to say. Lord, move among us and speak to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. So this is the, the final week as we step into Luke 19 of the ministry of Jesus. Three years he's been ministering to the people all over Israel. And he's reached and he is entering the city of Jerusalem. The place of the temple. The place of the feasts and the festivals, the sacrifices, the place of worship. And Jesus is allowing the people to honor him, to, to worship him. They're excited. They're, they're, they're joyful. And, and, and they're beginning to just pour out this sense of joy and praise that their king, their Messiah, has arrived. You know, recently we had a, an event here for, for the women called Choose Joy. And my wife and I came in early. We had actually gone over to a bakery and bought some of the stuff for the tables, and we were putting them out. And we had, a, we had a sign over here. We had a sign over here. And there was a sign right here in the middle that said, Choose Joy. But the sign that said, Choose Joy, was kind of, it was a little low, and you couldn't see it real well because of the, well, because of this podium and, and because of the speaker would be standing here. So it kind of blocked the whole choose joy thing. So Lynn and I were standing right there kind of, you know, surveying the stage and everything. And we walked out in the foyer and Lynn looked at me, uh, my wife Lynn, kind of seriously, she said, you know what we need to do here? I go, what? She goes, we need to raise a little joy. <laughs> I said, what? She goes, yeah, that joy sign needs to be raised up. And I said, well, we could raise a little joy. And, and I, I say all that to say this, that that's what's happening here. They're raising a little joy. You know what I'm saying? They're like going nuts. The, 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 the king has come into the city, and they are raising their voices. They're, they're raising some joy because Jesus, well, he's not just, as it says in Isaiah 53, and I'm just going to bring this verse up here. It says, he was despised, rejected by men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. He was not just a man acquainted with sorrows and grief, but Jesus was also deeply joyful. And I believe that he had a powerful sense of that when you're around him, of joy, of light, of, of, of being hope in a dark world. When you're around Jesus, I don't think you got depressed. I think you were joyful. I've got a, uh, a picture that I keep on my desk in my office that reminds me that Jesus is a person of joy. It's called, it's called the laughing Jesus. And most of the time I think he's laughing at me, but it's, he, he, he's joyful. He's a joyful king. He's a joyful Lord. And, and he has come into the city and this Palm Sunday, and this is the atmosphere. It's an atmosphere of praise. It's an atmosphere of worship. And it's an atmosphere of joy. And I know some of you have, have been over to Israel. I've been over there a few times myself. And, and Jesus is on top of the Mount of Olives. And when you're on top of the Mount of Olives, 
You, you look across this small, thin valley called the Kidron Valley. And right across the Kidron Valley is the Temple Mount. I mean, it's a very narrow valley, and, and, and you can stand on the Mount of Olives and, and look right across and see the Temple Mount. I mean, it's just right there. And at this time, here's, here's the Mount of Olives. You go down, and here's the Kidron Valley. You go back up, and there's the Temple Mount. You can, it's almost level when you're looking across. And at this time, it's Passover, and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people are pouring in to the city of Jerusalem. And here's the scenario. Here's what's happening. You've got people camping everywhere. They don't have the fancy, you know, RVs and hookups and all that kind of stuff, but they've got tents and they've just got, you know, pallets and all over. This is what it would have looked like all over that hillside of the Mount of Olives. There would be people camping all up probably the side of the, the, the next mount where the temple is, Mount Zion. You, you just got them everywhere in the valley. It's just crammed with people. They're pouring into the city. It's kind of like Blue Angel Weekend on Pensacola Beach, time a thousand. You know, you're looking for a place to camp. You're looking for a place to park, so to speak. And, and anybody who has friends and neighbors, their houses are full of people. And Jesus is coming over that hill. On the other side of the Mount of Olives is the city of Bethany, where Mary and, and, and Martha and Lazarus ha, ha, had, had kept Jesus many times in their home. And it had just been a week since... If you know this story, you know the sort of flow of time. It had been a week since Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead. So, so, so listen, here's a scenario. Jesus coming up from Bethany, probably with his disciples and probably with Mary and Martha and Lazarus, who has been raised from the dead. And they're making their way into the city. And there's so much anticipation. There's so much expectation. Jesus will ride into Jerusalem. He'll go through the eastern gate. He, here's the rumor. Here's the anticipation. Here's the expectation. He's going to come through that gate. He's got a man most likely with him that he raised from the dead. They're, they're worshiping him, the king who comes in the name of the Lord. And their, their thought, their mindset is, this is the end of the Roman rule. Jesus is coming. He's going to set up his kingdom. He's going to sit on the throne of David. He, he's going to usher in the messianic age, and Israel will once again be the great and godly nation that God intended it to be. So there is like excitement in the air, anticipation. Jesus is coming down the hill. He's making his way, and they're shouting Hosanna. And there he is on this donkey. They're throwing down the palm branches. They're throwing their coats. He's, he's fulfilling prophecy right before their eyes. Zechariah 9.9, 9, you're probably familiar. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. They were well aware of this passage of Scripture, and it's kind of like they're watching prophecy being fulfilled right before their eyes, and Lazarus is there. And, I mean, you can imagine. It's just phenomenal. It's an electric atmosphere. And, and they're just beginning to shout and scream, and, and they're watching as right before their eyes, the king of kings is coming in to the city, the holy city of Jerusalem. It's our king. It's our Messiah. And worship and praise is now being given to Jesus, and he's accepting it. He's allowing it. He's allowing them to honor and worship him, which is so different, listen, from whatever Jesus has done up to this point. And not only that, but Jesus has created this whole scenario. He has timed it. He has established it. He knows what he's doing. He knows what's happening. Because many times Jesus would do an amazing miracle, like heal a blind man who had never seen before. And then he would tell them, hey, don't tell anybody about this. 
keep it quiet. He would heal a man who, who had never walked before. And he'd go, shh, keep it on the down low. Don't want this to spread around. He, he would cast demons out of people and say, no, no, it's not my time. Don't spread this around. And he would withdraw. In fact, in the Gospel of Luke, 40 times, in fact, over 40 times, you read in this Gospel that he withdrew. Over 40 times. Every time he would do something that was miraculous or amazing, he would withdraw to calm things down, to sort of bring a sense of quiet again. And again and again and again, over 40 times, Jesus in the midst of them being excited and wanting to make him king or whatever it would be, he would withdraw because he would never force himself on anyone. Jesus didn't say, I'm the good cow hand or I'm the good cattle driver. Jesus said, I'm the good shepherd. And sheep have to be led. They're not driven. I'm, I'm not a cowboy. I, 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 if, I've ridden a horse a few times in my life, and most of the time it's like this. I'm thinking, how do you keep from bouncing on this thing? I know how. You don't ride it. <laughs> but sheep you get in front of and lead. You, you can go to Israel today, and there are still shepherds out there in the desert, out there in those areas, leading their sheep, these Bedouins. And, and here's the interesting thing. Jesus said, you know, I know my sheep and they know my voice. And even to this day, shepherds, well, they have a name for their sheep. And they call them by name. This is not just a theological truth. Sheep are very willing to follow but they need to know their shepherd. And Jesus calls us to follow. He'll never drive you. He'll never push you. He'll never force you. He'll never overpower you. You have to make a choice when you hear his voice to say, I'll follow you. And so Jesus many times withdrew. And he began to... to prove himself and show himself for who he really was. And he desires you and I to follow him. In fact, he comes to you. He comes to me and he, he knocks. He calls us individually. But you have to choose. On this day, however, Jesus doesn't ask. It says he's drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives. And the whole multitude of disciples began to just rejoice and praise God. And, and with a loud voice, for all the mighty works they had seen, they began to shout, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And if you back up there to verse 37, it says, He was drawing near the descent. He's descending, drawing near where he would begin to come down into the valley. It's kind of a picture in many ways of what Jesus, God's son, has already done. How he descended from heaven down to earth, low enough, humble enough that he could be among people like you and like me. God comes into our midst. He lowers himself. He, he descends, so to speak, where he could touch us, where he could be touched by us, where we could have a relationship with him and he with us. And, and God knows all the limitations that you and I have. He became a man. He humbled himself. He knows the limitations of a human body. He knows the hurts. He knows what it's like to be rejected. He knows what it's like to, to bear burdens. He knows what it's like to have the joys of human life. And he also knows what it's like to have the pain and the loss that comes with human life. We have a God who is not only real, 
but who knows what it's like to be you, knows what it's like, but loves us all the more. I mean, look who responds to Jesus here in this valley. It says that as he's coming in, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice there in verse 37. The whole multitude. All the people recognize and realize, those who, who've been listening and following and, and he's received, Jesus is, is, is finally received by this multitude. He's, he's worshiped, he's celebrated. With great joy they praised him. And this was their chorus. Blessed is the king. The king was in their midst. The, the Palm Sunday then, and I would submit to you now, is a reason to rejoice because the king has come. And he's in our midst right now. He's arrived here in Jerusalem, here in our lives, the, the long-awaited prince of peace to, to be honored, not at this time to, to establish Israel, but to do something more important, to establish salvation for all mankind. Jesus is descending down into that valley. Jesus is descending down into Jerusalem and he will go to the cross. That's why he came. To pay for all the evil and all our failure and all our sin and he will rise again victorious over the grave. And like a shepherd who knows his sheep, he will say to those who receive him and who believe in him and who recognize that he's the true Messiah, who recognize that he fulfilled prophecy, who recognize that Jesus is the one, he will say to you, he'll say to me, follow me. And I will lead you to green pastures. I will give you a rest and, and, and I'll take you beside still waters where, where you will have a refreshing of your soul. I will restore that soul and I'll give you the ability to fear no evil and I'll prepare a place for you in heaven where you will dwell in the house of the Father forever. This is what's happening. This is Jesus on his way to, to pay the price for you and I and, and, and to be among the people and to receive worship. And I would submit to you on Palm Sunday that Jesus is here. Wherever two or three gather, he said, I'll be there. The king is in our midst on Palm Sunday. He's here in Gulf Breeze. I would submit to you he's in your neighborhood long before you ever moved there. And when you move there, he goes, oh, no, there goes the neighborhood. <laughs> he, but he's there. He's there in school with your kids. Long before you and I ever arrive anywhere, Jesus is there reaching and calling and knocking, opening blind eyes, so to speak, and so people can see real life. Jesus heals the brokenhearted. Aren't you glad for that? Amen. He heals the brokenhearted. He, he's, he comes to give hope. That's who he is. And that's why these people are shouting and singing. And that's why we can shout and sing on Palm Sunday because Jesus forgives sin. That's why he's really coming. Amen. He gives eternal life. He opens up a whole new life to people they've never had before. I, I love this, this whole picture here of Jesus finally allowing people to say who he is, to recognize who he is. Blessed. It's the king who comes in the name of the Lord. This is not Jesus saying this. This is the people. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. That's why they're worshiping. They finally recognize and get the big picture. Jesus is our savior. He's our king. And he's fulfilled prophecy. And he's fulfilled prophecy for you and I. All through Isaiah, it talks about him dying on a cross and he rose again and he's coming again. And you and I have a song to sing. We have a message to share. We have a king that has come for us. It's all about Jesus. They sing it, it says, with a loud voice. Not a time to be quiet. Now, I know the culture wants to keep Jesus quiet. Let's keep him out of the government. Don't let Jesus in there. Just take him out of the schools. No Jesus in the school. No mangers. Let's don't talk about Christmas. It's happy holidays. 
It's just like they've shut down the... We don't want to hear about Jesus. But I would submit to you, it's not a time for us to be quiet, especially in the culture that we live in right now. There's a lot of intimidation, I think, and, 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 and sort of... Uh, this, this thing that's going on in, in everybody's world that you got to be quiet about your faith, you got to be tolerant of other people, and I believe you do, but you know what? I don't think we have to be quiet about Jesus. Amen. They're not being quiet about their stuff. Amen. Holy schmackerel, I mean, it's crazy out there. <laughs> This whole critical race theory, all the stuff that's going on in our public schools, and, and, and it's time for us not to be weak, but to be just as bold and unafraid as these people were. Because we have a king. We have a Messiah. I, I, it's interesting here, the Pharisees called to him from the crowd. These are the, the you know, the, the religious people of that day, but they're certainly not believers in Jesus. They're religious people. And they say, teacher, rebuke your disciples. They shouldn't be doing this. They shouldn't be saying this out loud. But he answered and said to them, if I tell you that these keep silent, the stones would cry out. The first Christian rock concert almost happened right here <laughs> in Jerusalem. <laughs> I know that's corny. <laughs> He's not talking here about the rolling stones. He's just talking about stones. <laughs> there will be a stone that will roll soon Amen. away from the grave. But here Jesus says, hey, if these are quiet, even the, even the stones will cry out. And we'll look at that stone next week that rolls away. But here is the situation. A king has come almost... In like manner as he came into the world, he descended down into our valley and he let himself be known for who he really is. And he identifies with the people around and they, they recognize. And today is Palm Sunday. It's a day of joy. You know, you, you might be here today and life is not real joyful. Maybe there's stuff going on in your family or there, there's stuff going on in your marriage or there, there's issues going on with your health or, or with your children. You say, John, this is not a day that is real joyful for me. I get it. Or, or maybe you're here and Jesus is not your shepherd. You're not one of those who could say, you know, I know him and he knows me and I found life in him and peace in him. Maybe not. You may not know for sure. If you died, you'd go to heaven. Or maybe you've never had your sins forgiven. Or, or maybe you're here and you, you need to take a step of faith. You know, in the, in the Gospel of John, there, there's a great passage. Uh, I love this passage. It, it's in uh, chapter 1. It says, uh, John himself is writing. He says, he was in the world, speaking of Jesus, and in him the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. He says it's more than just believing, but it's also for those who received him. I mean, a lot of people believe in Jesus. A lot of people believe in God, but they never received him as their Lord and Savior. You know, I believe in George Washington. I've never received George. But I believe, you know, all about him, that he crossed the river in the boat and that he was a great general, that he was the first president of the United States. But I'm not trusting in George Washington for anything. Now, every once in a while, I'll pull out one of his pictures and I'm trusting that they'll take it. <laughs> they still do at this point. But other than that, I'm not trusting George Washington for much. And a lot of people believe in Jesus like they do George Washington. Oh, yeah, he lived, he died, he, you know, he came, and he's a great man, and he was a great teacher. But he's more than that. 
He was the Messiah. He's the king. He's the one who descended in, in, from heaven to earth to, to take our place on the cross, and he's the one who's coming again. He's the one and the reason for which we celebrate Palm Sunday and Easter. And he comes to, to you and I, and he, and he says, Behold, I, I stand at that door, and I knock. I won't force my way in, but if you open the door, I'll come in. I won't drive you and push you and make you believe. I'm not a cattle driver. I'm not a human driver. But if you open the door, I'll, I'll be your shepherd. And I'll lead you and I'll guide you. And I'll take you to places of, of rest. And I'll take you to places of comfort. And I'll, I'll, I'll be with you and walk with you through, through times of, of, of death and sorrow. And, you know, the great psalmist David pinned it that way. He says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I don't have to fear evil, for God is with me. I don't, I don't know how people walk through those valleys and those shadows without the Lord. I mean, I, I've walked through a lot of them with people and even in my own family with my, uh, you know, I, I've had the, um, the crazy life of doing my own mom's funeral, my own stepdad's funeral, my own brother's funeral, my own sister's funeral, and on and on it could go, my best friend's funeral. And I know what it's like, and I can't imagine walking through those valleys without the Lord. Amen. How do you do that? How is that possible? I'll never forget when the church had just gotten started and, and I was at home one Friday with my wife and the phone rang and it was a hospital. I said, hey, there's a couple here. Their name is such and such and they say you're their pastor and they want to know if you'll come up to the hospital right now. They've got a child who's in ICU. And I go, whoa, what's the name? And I, and I but I said, Lynn, do you know the so-and-so? She goes, no, I don't know them. I said, I don't either. And I said, who are they? And she, they said their name again. They told me the situation. I said, oh, okay, I'll come. And when I got there, I realized they were new. They were, they're a military couple. They had just gotten involved in the church. And they had a little girl, beautiful little three-year-old daughter who had fallen into a bed of fire ants. Her mother was a nurse. There she was talking with some lady across the fence, saw the little girl playing, you know, by the swing set, and she, she fell. There was a little puppy she was playing with that kind of knocked her over, and the fire ant swarmed her body. She went into anaphylactic shock. They rushed her to the hospital. You know, the ants just went all up her nose and everywhere. And, and she, the mother took her to the shower and cleaned her off. I got there. And they had her on uh, oxygen, and she was in a coma. And we, we prayed, and we asked God to heal her. And three days later, she passed away. It was the saddest thing. I'll never forget standing just down the road at this uh, this cemetery with with that family and a group of us standing around with a little little pink casket. And and I thought, Lord, how how would someone walk through this through this valley and this shadow without you? And there was a lady there, one of the ladies, part of our congregation. We were all just standing. We had said some words. We had had some prayers. And all of a sudden, this person had a very, very beautiful voice. She began to sing, Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children in the world. And, and there was not a dry eye standing around that little pink casket that day. And yet we knew deep in our heart and in our spirit that Jesus loved this little girl. And he took her home. And, and I thought to myself, you know, if that was my little girl, because I had a little girl at that time, I said, how, in, how would I walk through this valley and this shadow without the Lord? So I, I didn't grow up a believer but there was a time, there was a point in my life where I realized and, and, and knew that the Lord was knocking on the door of my heart. I was witnessing some of my friends and even my own brother have a life transformation with the Lord. And I was watching their lives literally change. 
And there was a point where I had to choose because I knew the Lord was knocking. There was a point where I had to choose to open the door. You know, the Lord says this, come, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they can be as white as snow. And there's a, there's a reasoning that goes on, like, okay, Lord, I, I'm, I'm sort of watching, I'm, I'm, I'm reasoning, I, I'm, I'm looking at the different options, and, and I came to the place where he didn't force himself on me. I came to the place where I thought, I need to invite him in. He's knocking. I don't know how long he'll knock. And I had to make a choice. The, the scripture over and over again, you know, here comes this, this king riding into the city. And I, and I believe there comes a time when the king comes to your door and to my door. And he says, today, today is the day. He, we, none of us know what tomorrow holds. I mean, we live in a crazy world. I, I, don't, I don't watch the news a whole lot, but I've been watching it lately with this crazy Russia-Ukraine thing. And I don't think, I mean, I was around, I've been around for a while. I was around when Vietnam was going on, other wars and skirmishes in our world. And this is mind-boggling to me what's going on in our world right now. If you don't know the Lord, he fulfills prophecy. We see it right here, Zechariah 9.9. 9. And he says he's coming back again. And I think right now the whole world is kind of like, especially believers, come, Jesus, come. <laughs> right? School systems falling apart. America is, 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 is being turned into the, a whole different kind of culture. And even the governmental system is changing. We're, we're watching things just begin to crack and break. And we're all like, what, what, what's going on? Well, I like what my friend Ray Bentley said one time. He said, things aren't falling apart. They're falling in place Amen. for the Lord to return. Amen. And... The Lord has an appointment with people. He had one this day where he finally came to the place where he said, okay, let them declare who I am. I'm not withdrawing this time. This time I'm just going to let them cut loose and say who I really am. And if the religious people don't like it, if these people don't like it, if the Romans don't like it, I don't care. Because I've come to fulfill prophecy and he knew he was headed to the cross and that his time was here and they knew for sure now who he was. Now they were a little ahead of themselves with the messianic kingdom but he was calling. He was knocking. He was revealing and that's what he does. And if you're here today and you don't know him if you don't know him for sure then he's calling, he's knocking. And the question is, what will you do? See, Jesus has done everything he can possibly do for you and me as far as salvation is concerned. It's not like he's going to do something else. He died on the cross, he rose from the dead, he gives the promise of eternal life, and he says, you can know for sure that you have it, and the ball's in your court just like it was in theirs. You say, John, this is kind of heavy stuff. I know. But you know what's heavier? Is to hear a message like this or to, to know that the Lord is knocking on your door and to be in a place where maybe your, your heart has been broken or you, you live a life where you, you know that it's not right or there's this loneliness inside that you can't fill or there's this thirst that won't go away. What's heavier than, than saying I need to make a choice is to not make a choice and to continue to live that way. Amen. So why would you not? Come home to the Lord.